uh, we've got Chad Olson here uh, on the show. Chad, thanks for joining us. Hey, Adam, how we doing? So we we just like had like thirty seconds of banter, and I already had to start <laughs> recording because <laughs> we we're, we're diving into things that I want to discuss. But um, I guess you know, just real quick level set: who are you, and what's what's your company do? Yeah, my name is Chad Olson. I'm the CEO of a company called ABRL. Uh, original company name was Advanced Voice Research Labs Inc. Um, we had brought some tech out of school in I think 2012. Um, that company produced some tech that ended up becoming an in-car voice system for this massive German company. Um, through these like trials and errors, we picked up some pretty strong investors like SAP to come in and connect disparate systems. Through the grapevine of us working with some large Fortune 500 shippers, one of them introduced me to a large 3PL and intermodal company in like 2019. We've been since then connecting large shipper platforms and automating the execution layer from 3PLs, asset-based carriers, directly to those systems uh, without APIs. That's what we do. Incredible. Yeah. Now, let's get to the most, I mean, that was beautiful, beautiful <laughs> Let's get to the most important thing uh, of this conversation. Your website. It's <laughs> one Borderline of my favorite offensive. <laughs> no, no, it's not offensive at all. It, I, we were talking beforehand. Our our mutual friend Scott Oslin uh, introduced me to some of your some of your stuff, some of your content. I was like trying to dig into like, okay, now what does this company actually do? Went to the website, and I, I'm not making this up. It sent. It essentially says like we handpick 18 people to work with this customer <laughs> apply or something like that. Right. What's it, tell us about ba that. Basically that we, so when we looked at transportation and logistics, there's this fundamental flaw that's happened over and over and over again, which was growing and failing to deliver white glove service. And so when we were looking at our go-to-market, we were like, look, if we cap the number of customers that we bring on each year, we could guarantee deliver white glove service through the entirety of our relationship with those customers. And so the thesis behind the website was that we were going to deliver white glove service in, in its entirety for however long. What we ended up doing was we, I think it was maybe like a year and a half ago, we ripped down our site and we just put up this banner that basically says AVRL, we select 18 companies per year to automate. And when we look at our automation, it's it's decades beyond what is in, in existence today in the industry. And what ended up happening was that the less and less and less that we started to advertise the faster and faster and faster we grew. And so for us, we don't advertise, we don't market our services. It's all it's grown a hundred percent via word of mouth. So I want to get more into that and how, how you foster that word of mouth, but what was the conversation like with investors when you're like, yeah, we're, <laughs> we're cool on, on <laughs> doing new sales. So we have some pretty strong investors. We have some money from uh, Fontanalis partners. They wrote the check into freight waves. They wrote the check into chain IO um, I actually did the d due diligence for one of them on Chain.io, uh, but cool. we have money from SAP, Social Capital, like Chom, Chom is doing like in crazy, crazy, incredible things, yeah. but they had never seen a company that didn't advertise before. And when you look at the VC landscape, <laughs> they like companies that are consistent, right? Did the same thing over and over and over in a repeatable pattern. I'm pretty sure that every single one of our investors told us that this would fail and we <laughs> I think if we were to do it again, it definitely would fail, um, but it worked and it's working really well. So why do you think it worked for this, this one instance? So in transportation and logistics, there's two really negative things that happen with technology. One, everyone is out there feature hyping like crazy, right? Like our tech can do this and it can do this and it can do this. And it, they fail to deliver a lot of what they promise. And that negatively impacts the entire industry and all technology in the industry. Another thing that ends up happening is that there's a lot of copycat mentality that happened in transportation and logistics where company says, hey, we can do X. They really can't do that. They're trying to learn it as they grow their business. And what we've seen is that when we don't talk about our product, when we don't talk about our service and no one really understands what we're doing, how do you compete against that it makes it incredibly difficult one, but two, it creates this really like interesting psychological moment inside of a customer's head of like, I want to understand what AVRL is doing to see if it can help my business. And 
I mean, it also helps that we've been delivering some like pretty important technology in the industry that's really, really been needed for a long time. But I think that our results have been speaking and driving the customer acquisition. Like when we look at, we did a fireside chat with ArcBest. We had increased their net new shipment count by 300%. It's pretty hard to argue wow. that the value isn't there or is yeah. there. Um, and so what ends up happening in an industry like transportation logistics is that this pretty ancestral in nature, um, you know, head of, head of brokerage at Schneider is friends with the head of brokerage at like a JB Hunt. It's guaranteed like to be a secret that's shared internally. And I think that that's, what's been happening for us. That's cool. And I want to hear more about how you broke into this industry specifically, but just following up on, on that strategy, then um, what does, what does outbound or what does growth look like for you all? Obviously there's the one-off conversations, but is there any version of pursuing uh, the types of business that you want or the accounts that you, that you want to work with? I mean, we're working with about 50% of the top 103 PLs and we entered into transportation and logistics in 2020 during COVID. <laughs> and so when you look at the growth, it's pretty strong, especially for, a team that's about a hundred and we have 90 engineers, um, wow. no sales team, no marketing team. When you start to like, um, when you start to look at the growth rate, not even from like a customer standpoint, like the amount of technology that we're shoving into the industry is insane because of how large our engineering team is versus, you know, a company that might be a hundred strong has, you know, 40 salespeople. Right, right. Yep. Okay, so let's get into then your background and, and how, I mean, this is an extremely niche thing that you're doing. And I guess it's gotten more niche as you've, as you've kind of focused on the supply chain space. Um, maybe yeah. it was a little bit more broad before that, but how did that come to be? Tell us the, the story. So we're, so there's this fundamental problem that exists in, in supply chain. And we were looking at it from the warehousing side and the procuring side of, at, for large shippers. And it was, I'm going to use like an example, like if you are, let's say a Walmart and you run, you know, carrier point as your TMS and you run as another platform called retail link and you have a different WMS that you custom built. And then you have an ERP that's SAP. Well, SAP legacy systems can't expose APIs. You can't get data in and out, which means you can't sync information across all systems. It's a big, big problem that exists in, and persists throughout pretty much every shipper. Well, we started working with a top five um, shipper. They ended up introducing me to JB Hunt. We came in, ripped and replaced a bunch of their automation. It was a perfect fit for our technology and the use cases that we wanted to deploy they introduced me to somebody else. They introduced me to someone else. There was an acquisition that happened, to, you know, caught on fire. And we got kind of circled, like circled into that inner web of supply chain. We actually don't think that the market's as like limited or niche as, as, as it might look. Because when you look at even, you know, a shipper and how they interact, like let's say you're dan owned foods and you want to work with walmart you want to work with dollar general you still have to interact in those disparate systems across the chain and so really it's not just limited to 3pl's asset asset carriers it could expand to shippers etc i feel like you have this very like honed in focus that <laughs> it, it, on providing the solution to the customer and obviously that's paid outcomes with you but even in how you sell and then when i was looking looking up some of the company background it looks like you've raised essentially once and have been yeah. able to deploy that like, actually i'll cut i want to just i didn't mean to cut you off but oh, no, we, you're good. so we went and raised and our raise was insane we did i think an, a safe that was capped at maybe 10 and because we were growing so quickly, our investors off, uh, offered us a million and a half or 1.4 on an uncapped safe. And we haven't converted them because what had happened at that same exact time was that's when we started to take off. And we've self-funded a ton of tech. Like we we self-funded the a building of our own custom browser so that we could manipulate the HTML. You know, most startups don't have the luxury to do that, but we run an extremely profitable 
And that's really important to also not just our direction of product, but also the control of how we want to negotiate contracts, how we approve things via, via the board, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, that's essentially where I was going to go or, or, or where I was hoping you'd explain. Like, So do you think that competitively, obviously at the time, I don't know if you would have had the, the foresight to to say this or not, but like, do you think you're competitively advantaged by the fact that you're essentially cash flowing and so therefore not rely? Like if you had raised a ton of money, maybe you would have had to have a huge sales force. And you know what I mean? Like, do you think those distractions come into play? Yeah, I mean, there's this... Um disalignment from VC versus founding team or startup, which is the VC's goal is to get you to spend money so that you need more money and it creates right, that steamroll. Right. If you're a startup and you're trying to run a profitable business, you're focused on not growing too quickly. You're focused on making sure you're expanding. You're making sure that you're expanding in those right areas. And what, um, what, having full control of AVRL allows us to do is that if we see a unique opportunity for a product, I can start deploying resources for it today. I don't have to go and get a board Unreal. approval. When we look at, you know, pulling the trigger on a new data science lead that we want to go and try and build a custom product that we might push into another industry, I don't have to go and beg my VCs to allow us to do that. We can just do it. And I think that profitability should be important to all all startups. Maybe you know, Amazon could have never been profitable from day one. It's It wouldn't have been possible, but sure, they always sure. had a path. And I think that a lot of startups don't have a path to profitability. And so they just consume money, consume money, consume money, build big teams, fire, build big teams, fire. Right, and right. it's, and it's um, kind of like counterproductive to the growth of their organization versus being like, super targeted on what what our outcome is or what we're trying to achieve. I love that. Um, so what about currently, you know, what are you seeing in the market in terms of, I think, especially when there's uncertainty or, or a downturn, or I'm not even sure what we're in currently economically, but um, sometimes R&D or, or these types of um, new initiatives can be some of the things that get postponed or, or pushed. What are you facing? Are you able and how are you able to overcome some of that? We're actually seeing accelerated growth. And wow. so when you look at the 18 customers that we're going to onboard this year, we've actually signed contracts with nine of them already. Um, and what we're doing is we're actually working on our deployments that will come out in Q3 and Q4 right now. And that creates this like really interesting model where I'm not stressed about selling for today or for this month or this quarter. We're working on continuing to provide white glove service so that we do get our annual contract renewals. But at the same time, we're onboarding at a pace that allows us to also onboard new engineering, restructure our organization as we grow. The thing that's interesting about automation is that you know, when we look at the market of capacity tightening, capacity loosening, which just changes the rates, et cetera. I think that every single 3PL and asset-based carrier today is focused on automation. If they don't, they won't be able to compete as soon as capacity tightens again. Yeah. So everyone kind of knows that's where they have to have to head towards. Two, yeah. I can't get over the thing. So I have to ask two more questions on it. When it comes to onboarding the 18, mm -hmm. um, are you doing that? No, we have, so we, I got really lucky and I, and it was that I realized that if we wanted to participate in transportation logistics, we needed to hire people from the industry. And we went out and hired former freight brokers, former pricing analysts, former, you know, like CSRs that worked for like a TJX and we deployed those people. And so our layers are engineers, engineers, project coordinator, technical delivery manager on top. And so it's the technical delivery manager that's actually doing the requirement gathering, making sure that we're deploying in a correct way. Um, I think that there is a fundamental problem that it, that persists in the industry, which is like technology companies think that they can come in and enter transportation logistics, but do, does any transport or does any like technologist understand what an OD pairing is? <laughs> if you're not, like how can you even communicate with them? And I think that 
it do, it's not really talked enough about and maybe it, it's on purpose but transportation logistics has its own language you have to learn that language yeah. if you can't learn that language you can't sell in you can't deploy you can't do the requirement requirement gathering that you need to to be successful we've done a really good job of executing on that yeah i was just talking to uh, whitney cowell from kch transportation formerly freightways and about what you just said. And she said it perfectly. She was like, um, supply chain, you know, folks, supply chain people are the most proud of being from supply chain than any yeah. other industry. Like they, it's very much the jargon, the language, um, the culture. And so it's, it's unique that way. Yeah. Um, last, last, uh, question for th or thought I wanted to dig into is in the midst of having this brand kind of under cloak and, and building just a behemoth <laughs> that it's kind of hidden, you have built a very um, strong following on LinkedIn. You seem to have a lot of engagement there. What First of all, was that intentional? Was that something you, 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 you decided you wanted to do? And then what has that done for the business? I don't know how to answer this the best way. So when we looked at my posts on LinkedIn, um, I I talk to a lot of CEOs, a lot of COOs, a lot of VP of operations or heads of brokerage, and there's this consistent theme across everyone. And for some reason, a lot of those people really feel like they can't really speak their mind from the standpoint of the industry is very political. For some reason, maybe it's because I don't advertise, maybe it's become because I'm coming in and increasing the revenues, et cetera. I've kind of fallen outside of that political landscape, maybe because for a long time, no one knew that we existed, even though we were deploying so much tech into the industry. And what I was doing was writing based off of my conversations with the industry. And so a lot of the content that I'm com like coming up with, it's not necessarily that I have this massive content strategy. It's that I'm having conversations with executives. This is what we're talking about. And I feel like the industry feels that and needs to be heard. And I've kind of become honestly, like some of the voice for some of the people. Yeah. It's super interesting. If you go and look at Chad's posts um, there, you know, you'll say something like what you just said, like, you know, here's an uncomfortable truth. Nobody really wants to say. And then it's filled with comments of executives from all the, you know, of like, finally somebody, or I wish I could have, I would have said this or could have said it. it's super, it's just a weird uh, little cultural wrinkle in there. I think that people would be in awe if they saw who text me when I post those and feel like they can't like my post or feel like they can't mm. comment on it publicly um, but I want to be that person because I think that the only way that the industry is really going to move forward the way that it needs to, like, we can't continue to just incrementally move forward. We need to literally leapfrog into the future to reduce cost of carry, to increase and maximize yield. And the only way to do that is to change perception of the industry and to make it okay to talk about things that people don't want to talk about or feel uncomfortable about talking about. Do you ever get bite back or because like the reason that some of those people probably aren't comfortable with commenting or liking is they think they're going to get blowback for for whatever. Do you ever receive that personally? We haven't received it. I'm sure that there are companies out there that don't want to work with AVRL because of some of the things that I write on LinkedIn. And I that is a company decision that we've made that maybe those people aren't the best partners for us either. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense. But yeah. on the whole, it's been a net positive for AVRL, you'd say? Yeah, I would say that um, <laughs> it kind of plays into that website piece. I write something on LinkedIn, they go and look at our website, get a little <laughs> bit mad that they don't understand. And then they realize what we've been doing for the past two and a half years. And maybe that makes them more mad into understanding that there are companies out there who have fully automated their spot bidding fully automated their appointment scheduling, fully automated their track and trace um, communication, uploading their PODs, BOLs, lumpers, et cetera. And the whole game is, is that as soon as the market comes back, they're going to squeeze the profit margins and it's going to be really hard to compete on lanes. And that's what we are trying to do and trying to drive. 
dude, we we're out here having conversations, trying to drive, you know, trying to figure out the right messaging, do content strategy. You have a growth strategy of the you mad bro meme, <laughs> <laughs> leaning into it, and it's working. I love it. Massive respect to it. I think it's I think it's an incredible uh, a strategy. So, um, do, Chad, really enjoyed talking with you, getting to hear about AVRL. If if people do want to follow you, um, LinkedIn or elsewhere, I assume just your LinkedIn profile. It's Chad yeah. with two D's, right? Yes, sir. Yeah. Chad with two D's. And my last name spelled a little bit weird too. It's O-L-E-S-E-N. Cool. So make sure to yeah. check that out and, and follow him there, but appreciate you having you on and hopefully we'll talk soon. Awesome. Thanks, Adam. Mm-hmm.